Hello, I'm Julian Rubenstein and welcome to the White Privilege, sorry, <laughs> private, <laughs> private parts podcast. Uh, and I'm here, you know, to talk about things that are political, not so political. <laughs> My shirt, James shorts. There we go. His gym routine. <laughs> Julian, welcome to the podcast. Yay! Yay! It's quite intense to do that, isn't it? I mean, like you said, it is Tuesday morning. If someone was... It's not what you're expecting on a Tuesday. Okay, no. but here we go. Imagine if your boss walked in and he's like, right, down that camera, 30 seconds. He, he, he loves that well, shit, how, though. He how, does. Yeah. And how have you just put me as your boss? That that's... Well, I feel like you're like the host, aren't you? So technically yeah. you are like the boss of the pod. That's yeah. true. Or Pod you'd, boss. Or you would flip it around where you'd say you're the boss because we, we dictate okay. what you're you the, do. You're the captain. Right, shit, okay. Yeah. That's a dangerous thing to say to me, guys. Yeah, but I feel like in podcasting, especially sort of the way that some podcasts work, it's because it's like an amble, like it's a rambling chat. Jamie knows about this because he's got three. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you could just add bod. You like, have about boss, three. Boss pod. You have about three. You get. You yeah, get... but that wasn't like, that was when one died. <laughs> <laughs> that was when you had to like, one went to the old you know, <laughs> podcast. That was out of desperation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Also, yeah. what I love about some podcasts when they just die, no one, it's never referenced. They just, <laughs> yeah, they, yeah. you don't go, this is our last episode. It just, they just stop. That's it. Yeah. They like, just do you stop. know what we did actually on the Spotify one? Yeah, we, we did, did one. That. that was a good one. I like that. Yeah, that was really fun. Really fun. Has that yeah, died? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, Spotify had more money than since, didn't they? <laughs> so they said, look, we don't want to we don't need to pay for people. I gotta say, you know, if you're gonna do a podcast, kids out there, make it evergreen. <laughs> a weekly podcast, often not the best idea. It's the hard. Guardian can do it. Yeah, the New York yeah. Times can do that. Private parts can do it. Hey, private parts can get, guess what? We're, you don't we're hey, two you're evergreen. Two week, yeah. two you're week. still relatively evergreen. Yeah, that's you discuss, true. You discuss current issues. We, we but you want to you could just go back whenever you want. And also podcasting, which I worked at, is you have to offer something. Yeah, podcasting's offer. weird, isn't it? Yeah, I think you have to offer. Because I think what happens is that you can't just sit there and you you have to you, offer. you sort of do have to offer something, but also not. You can't be too forced because people like the kind of laid back yeah. kind of discussion. But this, this, I love how we like talking about it being laid back as we've got like microphones and like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. in our mouths, like <laughs> microphones <laughs> yeah. in, in All sweating. Do you know who I like, was? Like, I need to go to the bathroom. I'm going to go to the bathroom before this. Yeah, just, I was just, like, <laughs> well, I just jumped off the tube. It was like, anyone knows about sweaty Victoria line. That's actually a tube line, by the way, Jamie. Was it? That's what a tube is line is called. Is that the things It's called sweaty. Are those the trains that go? It's, I know... You, yeah, you don't get taught about them in your school. Like no, they are they are real. They're real thing. There's like trains underground. Under it's always the perplexed ground. you where those people are emerging from underground. Sure. What do you what do you feel about people, especially stand ups, who do um, who are quite heavy, heavy on their ideas and their political ideas yeah. and their things like like okay, what do you think about Gervais? Uh, I've got I've got um, love this, love this, love this sort of Tuesday. Not, the thing is, I think Ricky Gervais is. There's, there's, there's no way in denying the huge impact mm. he had on, you know, I mean, the comedy, is, right? I mean, mm. he, I always say it's this, insane. His, his nineties comedy, the way he played David Brent stood like, it was like a decade of how people did comedy. Totally. All, all that like, oh, it, it, I never think Stephen Merchant gets enough credit no. personally. Stephen Merchant's great. He's Love an it. absolute don. Um, I'm not like Gervais isn't really like, what I'm going in for. Do you know what I mean? Like if I'm going to watch stand up, but I mean, you can't ignore the man. I mean, he's a he, genius. He was hilarious, but I do find after all, it gets a bit tiring. It's not His... my jam. It's not my jam. I'm one of these people who actually preferred the American office. Really? What? After season wow. two. It's very okay. funny. That's punchy. After no, the American office two. is freaking great. Yeah, yeah, the American I've... office is one of the greatest shows of all time. Yeah, it's very funny. Like I know, you know, unpopular opinion, but that's how I'm rolling. Yeah, but it, it's funny how you say, I remember there was a great speech that uh, Gervais and Stephen Merchant did. And it was, I don't know what award ceremony it was. It was something, and it was it was back in the day. And he, Gervais even at the time made the joke. He said, it turns out you don't really get paid that much for being a writer, but as the actor, you get paid shitloads. Yeah. And, he, and he was making a joke in front of Stephen Merchant that Merchant didn't get paid that much, but Ricky Gervais was just loaded because he was playing mm. a character writer, all these you know different it is? things. It's because you, if you come out trying to make satire, one of your biggest concerns of a satirist is don't punch down. Yeah. Right. Choose he your always targets. Punches down. I don't like seeing mega stand ups making jokes about trans people. I just think mm. it's lazy. Nigel Farage, you know, populism is called populism because it's popular. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Do you think we're hardwired to be savages? What, Jamie, particularly? <laughs> <laughs> I think Jamie massively is. <laughs> I actually think you are. I think the I first think I'm as time well, yeah. I ever saw Jamie and Spence on TV, I thought, <laughs> cavemen. 
Do you think people are like so that? Funny. Do you think people are like that? I think I think there's a, a, a really horrifically terrifying baseline nature of where we tell other people that something else, some these are the reasons you got problems. Like right now, it's refugees coming over in boats. Yeah. Right? Like the most desperate people. And also people who, you know, you ever been like your house been bombed and had mm. to grab your kids, jump in a truck, leave all mm. your possessions and go and jump in a boat? I haven't. Because mm. we haven't been tested. He nearly had it at Carnival. <laughs> this place yes. in Notting Hill. I I've seen Jamie's <laughs> refugee we were We were talking about it. Yeah. He, he, he had to leave to go to, I've had that. to San Tropez. I, was, <laughs> I, did, I had to go and stay in a hotel. I had to go and stay in a hotel. It's so ridiculous. He was he literally didn't. put in Juela <laughs> for his own good. <laughs> <laughs> that's where we stayed for two years. Who's so he in Joel yeah, yeah. and then occasionally like yeah. scumming it, like roughing it in cap for at. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Joel and is right next to Can. Yeah, oh lovely. my god! Wait, hang on. I want to hear this. So um, you've got to always assume that, or you hope, or we did hope, I think, for a long time, that the adults were in charge. Oh my mm. god! You're speaking my language right now. Do you know what I'm saying? Dude, you're just like, oh, nothing like that would ever happen mm. because. The adults are in charge. Johnny, okay, this is my big, this is what happened to me. Maybe this didn't happen to you. Maybe it did. When I turned about 29, 30. Were you in Joel Lepin? I was in Joel okay. We were. I think about a couple of years before we were in Joel Lepin. Anyway, I turned about 29, 30. And I suddenly realized that no one knows what they're doing. Mm. Everyone's mm -hmm. guessing. Mm -hmm. um, your parents were telling, not lies purposely, but telling things that they thought was true. It probably wasn't true. And that the sort of political system, or the, your leaders, yeah. also didn't really know what they're doing. They're just guessing. There's humans who had been to good schools well, I don't or whatever. Know if it is. Boris Johnson is a human, but you know um, what I mean. I'm not sure that but that, but is that, that quite right. But, but that, but that some fear, sort of amorphous mess. Isn't it? <laughs> that fear, that that put fear in me, and I suddenly didn't. I suddenly went, "Holy shit!" Have you done therapy? Not really. I did. I did a couple of. I sessions. tried to get him into it with those blue eyes. I know. I look, I'm, at I'm, look, I'm, look at this. Look at this. Look at this lady with a therapist. I think I'm going to. Oh my god! Yeah, she was fit. Did you actually try to? But, but Minnie, I've tried to get you into it before because... Yeah, I think at some stage I will succumb to it. But I think... With, I think with I, that, I sort of came from that very like, oh, don't do that. You oh, yeah, no, no. Lip. So, so it, ta it takes a while to try and... Can like, I tell you something interesting? Do you know um, the stiff upper lip? Mm. You know that term? Mm -hmm. Did you know that was invented by an Oxford Don mm. after... No, sorry. During the First World War as a way to tell soldiers who were coming back, having seen the horrors of everything, their friends dismembered, everything mm. like that. They were like, we need to... These people are grumbling. Mm. So they created the stiff, upper, the lip. stiff upper lip. The terminology behind just it. Just to completely and utterly brainwash you. destroy. It's, it is a, a, very, it's a very of, British thing that we've created. Well, it is. It's I mean, the like, thing about you could only really have it in Britain. I think you could have it in, you could no. have had it in Rome or, or something. Yeah, but we were a gigantic empire. We were doing the most um, God forsaken, we, horrendous things. We, we almost had to turn away from emotion and turn exactly. away from the horrors that and we were And then to seeing justify it. it, we were like, oh, well, this is for the queen, yeah. for the country. And don't worry about these emotions. They're, they're, they're the other. <laughs> so when, you're, when your blueprint doesn't add up and you're suddenly living a life that you're like, I, this is not what I'm meant to be doing. Well, it's weird. That's yeah. when sort of- I've the, got a double, a double hit of that thinking about what you're yeah. saying, because, um, you know, I mean, just- this isn't like trying to be a humble break, but like the first time we ever actually, you probably don't even remember this because you were so, I mean, such a good time, was at the BAFTAs <laughs> when your show, when Main Chelsea won the Audience Awards, mm -hmm. Revolution won Best Comedy. Did it? And I was remember standing up on stage and looking out at all these people and realizing, because it was really fun, because when you come off stage at the BAFTAs, if you just won, you go to the back and there's like loads of journalists mm. and they hold up a board and you stand in front of them, they take a photo. And I remember it so vividly as Janice just went, oh, what have you won? Shut up. <laughs> and I just remember just thinking like, oh yeah, it's, it's bullshit, isn't it? Bullshit. It's all just bullshit. Mm. Like, it's, I don't get me wrong, one of the proudest moments of my life, but also an ephemeral moment I'd sort of been building to thinking this would have some meaning, yeah. which actually it really doesn't. But when I started, the reason that I started going to therapy yeah. was because I was in this... This life, I, I didn't, it was very inauthentic. It wasn't good. And it was find um, clarity in yeah. this relationship with this girl and refine direction in my career. Mm. And what I realized, and this is going to come back to all the stuff we're talking about and also why it's so, for me, so interesting exploring like my teenage years is because I realized that even though I'd said to people all my life, like I'm my own show, I, I think I can do it. I really didn't, I really didn't fucking believe it. 
Really? I really, really, I totally was self-sabotaging. I, I believed that, you know, really like I was probably quite shit and it wouldn't be me and it would, and it really takes, because uh, it was one of my best friends I was living with, a guy called Jamie, and I'd done a couple of stunts online and he was like, you're really good at this. You can mm. do this. And, you know, Hayden, who I, I made my stuff with, I'd known for a long time, but we'd been trying to do it as docs. And then I got introduced to Hat Trick meeting with them and I was I was going oh yeah well anything I can write on you know and then at the Financial Times had a couple I don't remember how many therapy sessions I'd had but it wasn't many yeah. you know four and I called him up and I was like right I'm gonna send you a treatment and I remember because I'd got all my sort of tele sales shit out the way and I was just writing on the computer like, tuk, 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 tuk. Mm. got a one page down and then literally half an hour later he called me back and he was like this is really interesting mm. It, what what caused that moment of realization? Because I've had similar things, yeah. And I look back retrospectively, and I didn't realize I was doing it, but yeah. I had like that voice every morning that was like, "You're shit. You're not really good. You're, so not, the you're not therapy, worthy of that." I mean, you do it in drama school as well. We had this incredible drama school teacher called John Biscuit. So John, where, if you're where, where was the drama school? Well, there was a drama. It was called Drama Center. It's just closed down, but like you know, Tom Hardy went there, Paul Bettany went there, Amory Duff. Like really, I was a mate, like amazing people. But John, who I believe is now the head of drama at RADA. Wow. And he was like, his wife, uh, very sadly, had just died of cancer. Mm. His kids were there. And he sort of demanded this honesty from you. Mm. You know, absolutely fucking demanded it. And he said, first day, he was like, listen, there's you and there's the little fucker. It's like the ego in the id, right? Your second voice. Mm. You always have that voice going, you're going to be really shit at that. You piece of shit. <laughs> always. And the thing is, we don't get taught about this. Yeah. No one goes in school. Oh, by the way. Your own brain hates you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the most it's selfish organ in the body that, and it wants to be in and control. And you have these 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 thoughts a day and you always pick up poof, that yeah. negative. Poof, well, what poof. I love is like, where does that voice actually form from? And I think right. that is like, yeah, it really must be from a, like, it's early kind it's of conditioning right? from, from school. Because I wonder if it is. I don't know. I think it's also a defense mechanism because it's it, usually yeah, I a think no. that's a big, big part of it's it. It's like a stop, right? Yeah. But it's like, so have you ever heard that phrase? Like the mind is the most selfish organ in the body. All it ever wants to do I've seen his is being controlled. <laughs> it was such a profound moment. It was such a profound yeah. moment. The mind and you jumped is the in. The most selfish organ in the body. Append mm. them, unless you're James. Unless that's James we, Wiener. <laughs> wait, wait, what is. In that case, <laughs> wait, what's forget that? everything. Because <laughs> the balls are. Do you think Jay has heavy balls as well? I think they probably drag his penile <laughs> yeah, yeah. down somewhat. It looks like a chariot. <laughs> <laughs> that's what it looks like. It looks a like a fleshy, chariot. A fleshy chariot. Wait, hang on. What is this saying? I want to hear this. So it's, 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 it's true. It's, 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 I, I got, you know, I mean, obviously uh, at some point in my career, I got into yoga in Goa. Wow. <laughs> of it. course as well um because i'm a middle, middle class white man <laughs> yeah. i'm in With that, podcast. I'm, I'm yeah, in that stage you. at the minute so. exactly I mean, wait hang on so wait, i want to hear the so what are the the the, the saying about so the we're mind jumping episodes no again, but but the saying um, of the mind was what so the, the the idea that the mind is the most selfish organ in the body and always wants to be in control mm. is to help you start to recognize intrusive thoughts for what they are because thought patterns negative thought patterns tough but you can change those mm. you can work on that and a lot of people like what you're talking about Al, what i find so interesting is and i'm not saying but i don't know you well enough to know about this but most of my best friends who need therapy the most have never done it and it's about if you it's like tools in the toolkit right like part of therapy is helping someone help you understand where these things are happening as a matter of course in your life, but you don't have the words to be like, ah, oh, that's the little fucker. That's the intrusive thought. Don't listen to that. Mm. That's just bollocks mm. because the thoughts aren't real. They're just trying to stop you. Basically you, you're, you're in action, right? You're in your body, your heart's driving you, your gut's driving you, just moving around. And then your thoughts like, don't fucking do that. Mm. <laughs> it's exactly and right. So this is what I find so interesting about like interpersonal reality that we're talking about, the expanse of our minds, you know, us talking about these, you know, three guys here talking about our feelings. That's good. Mm -hmm. Right. And then you talked about, you know, we talked, we started this talking about the adults are in charge and mm -hmm. the larger system and the political reality. And I think these things are very, very interrelated because I think that actually, particularly as guys our kind of age, we were not raised by a culture. It's not just toxic masculinity. It's much more profound and intricate than that. Because it was like, it wasn't just about being strong, cool, successful. It was that 
everything was kind of fine. Mm. Yeah, completely. Everything was fine. Like 80s, 90s, like everything's fine. Mm. And this is, I mean, when I started doing my politics degree at Sussex, the first text we read, this was in 2000, was Francis Fukuyama's The End of History. We were that confident. We're like, it's done. Yeah. <laughs> really? <laughs> no, like, Everything's fine. <laughs> Everything's done. Nothing, there's no more. Pretty much, guys. I mean, what you're going to study is the past, but we've smashed it. <laughs> <laughs> what? You look back at it now and you're like, these guys were tripping balls. Yeah. That's insane. But, but I, and interesting what you then said about that moment that I don't remember when you guys won the BAFTA mm. and Made in Chelsea won the BAFTA for uh, the audience. Yeah, um, you won the audience award, didn't you? Audience award. It was this, and I, I don't think- 10 years ago. Oh, the year I joined that. The year the you joined. joined so. But there was this moment- Well, right? just, just <laughs> saying. Uh, walked in. But, yeah, I walked in. But there was this, there was this moment, which I, I, I remember so well, is that we were at the BAFTAs and I thought I was fucking God's gift at this point. I was dealing with all no, the things Jamie. like- No, Yeah, yeah, exactly. But I- Because that is not what we thought about you and Spencer <laughs> at that point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At all. But there's this thing, there was this way, and I was dealing with all this anxiety, all these things, but I was handling at a point, but I thought, you know, we're cool, all this kind of stuff. We won the BAFTA, and I remember getting on stage and seeing in front of me Olivia Coleman yeah. and Bennett Cumberbatch and all yeah. these people, and I remember suddenly realizing in like, within seconds, how uncool we were and how like ev these people looking at us were just sort of looking at us and sort of a, <laughs> like a, a, a bewilderment that these blokes who hadn't trained or hadn't gone to drama school hadn't spent their whole lives hustling were just on stage at the BAFTAs having won an award for being themselves and I suddenly went oh, oh fuck do you but remember Palin won the audience do you remember Palin won the like Michael Palin won the like you know they have that thing I every remember. year like the Oh, the, the, the person. The, the person mm. was like, yeah, that. And I remember I was just behind Spencer and he went up and he tapped me on the shoulder and he went, well done. And I went, oh, don't do that. Yeah, see that? Oh, it was just and blind then, confidence. And, yeah, of course. But then do you remember we all had to do a photo on stage? Yeah. And I hung them oh, up. fuck, it was so awful. No, it was really weird. It, it, was, it was really embarrassed. I was so, really, I know being embarrassed though. I was it's, embarrassed. It's a fucking mm. weird thing as well, because especially for us, because we weren't stand-ups, right? Yeah. So we had one show, Revolutionary Televised. First series, best comedy. It wasn't like best entertainment show. Best comedy. Beat Partridge. Wow. These people fucked our heads up. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was great. This is the second year we got nominated. But it was like, if you're not like in the comedy circuit, and I'm, I'm not saying this about all stand-ups, because there are some stand-ups that, you know, don't care at all. But have you, I mean, you've interviewed a lot of stand-ups. Yeah. Stand-ups are so competitive. Is it? Mm. So competitive. Well, there's only, this kind of, they are really supportive of each other, but actually, it's really competitive. It, they're competitive. And then, for then... People who were not involved in that scene at all mm. to suddenly win this award. Like at first, it was like, who the fuck are these kids? So you had that as well. You had that thing as well. Yeah, I mean, we're talking, uh, what we're really talking about is imposter syndrome. Yeah, right? I was going to say. And it comes back to this thing. But I think that genuinely, like, I wouldn't be surprised at all if, even though you're saying all this shit, I bet you, when we were like teenagers and shit, I bet everyone talked to you about their problems. Yeah. Because you're very, you're so approachable. Yeah, you're but I was so open easy. about, I think it's because I was open emotionally. I've always been pretty open emotionally. Yeah, emotionally intelligent. Stuff. But like in drama school, they always used to talk with this guy, John Skitz, where I was telling you about before. Just pennies dropping, right? So if the penny drops here, you're like, oh, you are not your mind, right? It, whatever. Yeah. You're, you know, what are intrusive thoughts? Mm. I think it's just the, t it's just, it's that knowledge. Just no, the knowledge, knowledge. Penny drop moments are amazing. Knowledge and happens. just learning, oh. learning bits from everywhere and then suddenly things click. It's another podcast then... title for the uh, Jamie Lang Empire. When the penny drops. Hi, welcome to when Penny's what? Drop. Penny, when the penny drops. When the penny drops with Jamie Lang. When the penny yeah. drops. Up I'm next, here maybe a... with my oh. fiance, maybe without, up, it's not oh, sure. Up next, we've got a 13 year old boy who's got a <laughs> lovely set of legs on him. <laughs> Hey, listen, team. We're going to stop there for part one. We're going to come back to part two. Well, I, I wanna... didn't even talk about the podcast. We know we got that. Check part out two. the new conspiracists. No, we're going to take that part two. By this, the way, we got part two coming up. These are two, they're two episode podcasts. Two episodes. Wow, back to back. Whoa! And we're going to talk about. Um, Can't pay for that kind. We're of We're going to talk about when you went to uh, Parliament, or was it Downing Street? Well, it and, depends on which time. And, and you, you and you, <laughs> and you, you dressed up as a removal man, and you tried to get Boris Johnson. Out. Out. Gonna come back and talk about that. Part two. See you in part two, everyone. Bye bye. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to part two of Private Parts. Um, 
Welcome back. Welcome back. Bonjour. Your voice is Welcome a, back. You've got a great radio voice. Thanks. You do. And also, <laughs> I like Clint Eastwood. Thanks, guys. Do, do, John, do you ever get nervous about stuff? Oh, yeah, for sure. I was nervous about this. What? Mm. No, get out of here. With us, guys. Jay, it's a weird, it's a weird thing for me because I don't often actually. Be the I most talk charismatic, about stuff. talkative person that I. Uh, Jamie. Don't. No, you. No, I'm not. I'm not trying to. I'm trying back. to bed me. I'm really. I'm not. I'm just. I remember coming it's on Tuesday your podcast. Tuesday morning. My God. I remember coming on your <laughs> podcast, and you were just. Um, I, I remember being. It, I got like we can sit here and just hand job each other if we want to but I don't oh, really, let's, you know, let's yeah. do it but like as in I remember coming on your podcast this is the 299 premium this is it yeah episode. this is late night <laughs> but I remember Fantastic. doing it and I remember thinking um you were just so good because you could you could interact while following a script and and I think I'm, I'm much better at that now because I have a, this other thing that I do but um you were so good at it you, oh man you, you were very Thank good at interacting you. and also what I find uh, amazing is that you okay coming from someone who i it feels like like we said before where you 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 want to you want that validation from people sure the yeah. line of work that you you're maybe best known for yeah um is very much sort of uh funny sort of satire comedy silly comedy S pranks on stuff oh, and, and and typically political which yes. can lend itself to having good comments and bad comments because you're oh, yeah. yeah yeah and oh, yes. and and you don't have that you don't have that sort of insecurity it seems like well or that embarrassment where you go and do these pranks i want to hear about them where you go out and do all these sorts of things it, it seems like you don't mind well no th that's different though because that's really about righteous indignation we, we explain that well so i believe that satire's function in society is to create conversation mm. around things so you may like it, you may not like it, but you'll talk about it. Yeah. So probably our most talked about thing we ever did was a sketch called The Real Housewives of Isis. <laughs> yes. <Yeah, so laughs> you know, we did The Real House. There was The Real Housewives of Beverly Hills. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Most people who talked about that sketch never watched it. They just were like, The Real Housewives of what? <laughs> That's a rage. What happened in the sketch? It was about... Um, can I show you? Can we, can we, is yeah, that, is yeah, that yeah. allowed? I'll, I mean, I'll tell you about, it. I mean, basically, you know, the Real Housewives of Beverly Hills. Yeah. We just did that in Raqqa. That's <laughs> you know? amazing. But it was, it was literally like, you know, we had someone coming in in a vest and being like, um, we were like, ladies, what do you think of this? And obviously it's a exploding vest. Mm. And she's like, oh, you look gorgeous. And then it cut to a girl, Master me. She looked massive. And then cut and another girl comes in like, ladies, hey, what do you think? Is that like, bitch. She knew I had that vest. Oh and there she, you know, God. I mean, it was, but it was, it was what we also did was it was like all the lines were verbatim uh, testimony mm. from people who had been in Raqqa under the experience of, you know. And what, what is it? What is the, for the naive mind who just sees that, what is the purpose of creating a sketch like that? Well, the thing is, I think with satire, you're, you're always trying to do two things at once, which you're trying to have a spoonful of facts. Uh, sorry, a spoonful of comedy to make the fact medicine go down. Ah, uh, so you you're know? feeding you're feeding the consumer mm. in a way that they yeah. can get it. But that went fucking apeshit. I mean, that had something like 79 million Facebook shares. It was what? the eighth most shared piece of BBC content of all time. Yeah. That's insane. They kicked off. There were 40,000 people who who started a petition to stop the show, The Real Housewives of Isis, coming out on the BBC. Even though it's just a three minute sketch that at the end went next week on The Real Housewives of Isis. <laughs> Are you serious? So it's nuts. But but do you and you've done it was all, when we moved to BBC Two, it was a bit mad. It was all a bit of a strange period it. of time. But hang on, so but you, the other things that you've done, like I said recently, is you you did the one where you went as a removal people right. to to Downing Street. Well, that happened very far. So thirty eight degrees, who have got a lot of time for, got in contact with me and were like, look, something like seventy thousand people have you know asked Boris Johnson to leave um, on the site. Um, so we got a massive van. It was a removals van and put, you know, Boris, leave means leave on mm. the side of it. Because that's what he said, right? Leaves means leave. Mm. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And then we went as the people's <laughs> removal service, had loads of boxes because his wife had called us down because he was getting a bit needy, a bit clingy. Mm. Didn't know when enough's enough when it's time to go. We brought lots of boxes, but unsurprisingly, the police weren't that happy. But it was classic because we pulled the van round and there's this very well-meaning guy. But he was looking at me because the only thing you really need for our stunts is a radio mic, mm. right? You just have to have one. Yeah, I have one of those. And we got close, and the guy just looked at me. He's like, I'm "Working, I'm working." Oh, so I just handed my iPhone. Mm -hmm. I was like, "Just follow me." 
And so oh it was all just shot on my phone. But it was basically like trying to get these books in, you know, there were lots of lines like, mm. you know, um, after us, uh, the fumigators are coming around, sort of, you know, spread the place, hopefully to respond some sort of smell of decency <laughs> and basic honesty to the office. Uh, and then, you know, but the thing is, it's, it looks very scary to people, but if you use police as props, there's good jeopardy there. Mm. You don't get nervous about those things. Well, I think I have to, what I mean about righteous indignation is, you know, I get nervous. Of course I do. You know, like when we gave, you know, David Cameron a, a Bullingdon album or yeah. Boris Johnson a, a book saying, you know, pretend biography, Boris Johnson, pathological liar, everybody loves a fool. Yeah. You know, of course you get nervous about that stuff. But if you feel you are advocating for vulnerable or groups who are not, um, uh, don't have the agency to uh, take these people down a peg or two, yeah. then I think I feel it's necessary. You feel almost urgent. empowered, right? You, yeah, see, yeah, yeah. you sort of separate yeah. yourself. It's a almost. duty almost. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think so. We, got, we had an unbelievable privilege, you know, I mean, doing a show, Revolutionary Televised was on for three series on BBC Three, then we did Revolting on BBC Two, the Ministry of Justice on Channel 4. You know, we had the opportunity to do hundreds of sketches, whether it was, you know, turning MI6 into the biggest torture club in town, <laughs> best torture club in Vauxhall, because they were involved in illegal yeah. abduction and transfer of people to torture, torture chambers through extraordinary rendition, or renaming Google's head offices, Old Google's, to celebrate the Irish tax avoidance scheme they were utilizing, which cost us, you know, millions and millions mm. of pounds. Wow. That was a huge privilege. But of course, yes, you shit yourself. But there's also, you know, um, as you know, you um, the more one does something and gets sort of praise, yeah, you, uh, the yeah. more we believe it is. But it was a stra it was a strange time. Mm. To, it's I just we yeah, did do a lot of it. <laughs> no, but it's but it's amazing. But you do so so you're from the sort of visuals and for the understanding. What you're always doing is that you're sort of. <laughs> You're rooting for the underdog. Yeah, I mean, I think that when you're when you do when you work with a national broadcaster uh, and you make such, you have to get stuff signed off, right? Like yeah. It wasn't like when we went after Boris Johnson, we had to demonstrate that he was a pathological liar legally. Yeah, mm. so you have to pass in all order to get the the BBC sign off in order to come to the show. Um, and he was even then. Mm. And then, you know, you kind of have, we would have made really great assassins because really what we're doing is find out where people are going to be, get, you know, yeah, the get, you catch get, them. Cause there's no take twos here. No. You, know, you go, you do the thing and you're, and you're out again. It, 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 I find it amazing because I feel like a lot of people are quite cagey with their sort of political views and where they stand. Well, and, yes. And, but it, why do you think that is? But I don't know. It's this because is, they want to get sponsored by brands, Jamie. Is that if, what it is? Yes, of course it is. The reality is we're living in a very strange time at the minute. Influencers, people with huge social following have become the major commodity, right? Yeah. You go to people for channels, yeah. right? But mm. now the budgets really are with brands and people don't speak out as a result of fear of being pushed away by brands, mm. which is kind wow. of a joke because, you know, it's taken people like Bella Hadid to openly talk about, you know, the aggression of, say, um, the Israeli Defence Force and the Israeli state about Palestine in order for it to sort of almost be okay for influence to talk about a huge political, cultural crisis. So you mm. think it boils down to the fact that they're just not going to get, they're not going to get the money. I don't, I don't think, I, I know. I think they're also scared really? of, yeah. of stirring the masses because they oh, don't want to get cancelled. So but people are just, the they thing, keep man, quiet about it. It's so stuff. messed up. It's so messed up. We're living in this strange time. You know, like I think like even like the word woke or wokery or, you know, cancel culture, like a lot of this stuff um, is built. Like for instance, that word woke, it's sort of to devolve the idea of basic empathy for other people of, of value because mm. it then becomes a political tool. And now literally you have people like Liz Truss going, I'm not woke. Yeah. How dare you have this? Like, what does that mean? Mm. Empathy for vulnerable groups, trying to help disenfranchised groups. It's fucking do, mad Do you me. think we're living in a tricky, in a really, in terms of sort of, I oh mean- Oh my, my friends. So, so, but give me this, because because look, yeah. you know- I, Do you want I, me to be real and I really want you to be try and catch you up? Yeah, yeah I, I, want you to, I want you to really um, educate me, maybe some listeners about well, well, how we'll we're start, living at the we'll moment. We'll start in a, in a slightly obtuse way. Yeah. So there's a brilliant filmmaker who I love 
called Adam Curtis. Yeah. Have you seen any of Adam Curtis's documentaries? I've heard of Adam Curtis. So he's an amazing kind of, um, um, I guess he's, he's kind of a bit of a, uh, he makes a very specific type of documentary, which is archive driven and is totally polemic. So he doesn't go, maybe it's like this or maybe it's like that. He's like, this is what I think it is. So he's right. hard nosed towards the actual, he's, what he believes. He's hard nosed. Yeah. Then he also, he wants to give you a point of view. And so he's made a film. One of the films he made was called Hypernormalization. And the idea was that term, hypernormalization, was the idea that in the Soviet Union, in Russia, towards the end, mm. um, you were being told one thing on TV, which the evidence of your own eyes and ears in the real world, you could see it was total nonsense. Mm. And there was a huge disparity between what you were being told and what you could see is. And I would argue that that's exactly what we're entering now. Yeah. Really? Yeah, I think 100%. we are entering a time where Rishi Sunak and Liz Trust, whilst vying for the golf club votes of 180,000 Tory party members, have said stuff in their campaign trails that is so detached from reality mm. that is just about trying to um, garner the vote of this one person they like by saying stuff they think's vote winner, that they've completely lost connection to rational discourse. And this is what we really experienced after Donald Trump mm. got elected in America mm. and after Boris Johnson um, and the referendum in the UK. Because as Emily Maitlis put it the other week when she did, there's a thing every year at the Edinburgh TV Festival called the McTaggart Lecture. And she just gave the McTaggart Lecture. And um, she said some pretty it's pretty scary stuff. Like what? Well, one of the things was that on the board of the BBC, there's a guy called Rob Gibbs, who um, uh, she describes as an active um, uh, Tory party agent, trying to, he, right. he was advising GP News, trying to sway um, Manipulating. BBC News coverage. Yeah, yeah. For, the, for the, you know, in, in favor of the Conservative Party. Right. But really what it's also about is that you see, I, I think with Brexit, there is, you know, British people often have voted against their own self-interest. But the thing is, you see, that ultimately where we are now, Britain, Great Britain, is that we have become a third country. And what that means is, like Romania, that we are outside of, we were one of 28 countries in a block. Mm. So you're quite good at negotiating, 28 of you. You'd usually beat up one guy mm. if you're 28 of you. Mm. But when you're one guy, you're probably not going to get the best terms the best deals anymore. Mm. It's harder to, to do. But obviously, the nonsense that was the referendum campaign was like, everything's going to be better after Brexit, guys. Oh God. And it's shit. It's awful. I mean, to the point where very strange things are happening. So we see a 17-mile queue going into Dover. Mm. It's obvious to anyone that that is because of Brexit and our political leaders can't say that for, for fear of a sort of mob of, for fear of not being called patriotic. Yeah. And then that's the what it is, news it? organizations decide it's probably better not to say the blindingly fucking obvious because it's not politically expedient. Because if we say it, we might get called unpatriotic and therefore, we might lose our license. It's please. all about being seen as unpatriotic for but some, this is, for this some is bizarre reason. This is the death mm. of rationality. But like, why? I don't because, get that. Because, they they well, end up lying, right? The and thing is that you've got to look at this in, 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 its, in its whole. We are living in an age of social media. Social media, populism itself, does very, very well on social media because it's simplistic, it's short, mm. and it's emotive. And that is stuff that, Outrage. That's what sells on social yeah. media. Donald Trump very famously said, you know, I could just shoot one of my, um, one of, I could shoot anyone on Fifth Avenue. My supporters would still support me. Because if I go on to mainstream press and I'm like, ah, oh, fake news, fake news. They'll be like, yeah, he's right. Because essentially it became like a cult, didn't it? It's not about like, what I really want is to make politics boring again, <laughs> right? I want to make it boring again. And I want to be talking about policies, mm. but it's entirely devolved into this weird personality contest 
where you also have actors because the entire British political system is uh, in, in what's called an unwritten constitution. So what that means is that in America, you have a written constitution. I'm sure we've all heard of the Bill of Rights and, um, you know, the Third Amendment and, you know, uh, what's their classic one, you know? You know, the, the, the uh, uh, you know, everyone's rights are the pursuit of happiness mm. and stuff like that. But over here, we don't. And a lot of it is based on the fact that people will be good chaps. They'll be good chaps and they'll just get on with being a good chap. What they weren't expecting was a government post uh, the referendum that tried and sought to illegally prorogue parliament, which basically means shut down parliament for five weeks. Let us get on with it with very little oversight. It's basically what it means. Um, or to, you know, stop the judiciary from doing, you know, things, independence of the judiciary, independence of the executive, and the parli parliament is sovereign, even lied to the queen. Demonstrated, that's not, it's not my opinion, that is a fact. Um, we, we couldn't possibly have predicted that, and people are pushing the system to see if it will give. And I mean, I think we really are entering a terrifying 18 months. Sorry, but really, well, the cost of living crisis it's, is- it's, it's scary. Is anyone who's earning under 45 grand, which is the vast majority of people in the UK, will uh, feel a severe, um, severe economic shock. In I, I am, I'm really scared. I, I don't think, you know, when you get people like Martin Lewis begging on Good Morning Britain mm. for the government, begging for the government to intervene. You know, we were told that Boris Johnson wanted to stay in post in order to make sure that during this period of time, someone was really watching how the country was going. He's been on fucking holiday the whole time. Yeah. It's unbelievable. What, you know? what, what, do, do, do you think, what do you think is actually causing the crisis? Is it ineptitude? Is it intentional? It's, it's or a perfect is it cause, storm of is it many things. Democracy has been fully compromised no, 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 it's by not just corporatism. That. When, we had, like... um, when we had, uh, when the war started in Ukraine, very few people really understand just how major, like it's the breadbasket of Europe. 45% mm. of the world's wheat is made in the 95 Ukraine. 95% of uh, sunflower oil or something yeah, comes from 95% Ukraine. of sunflower oil. And that's also affecting things like fertilizer. Mm. There is a gigantic shortage globally of fertilizer. Might not sound so bad now, in 12 months time, if the whole of the Horn of Africa cannot have a crop, you have mass famine mm. on a scale we've never seen before. Add to that the fact that because Russia as a sort of political tool, but it kind of had us addicted to its gas, right? It's natural gas. We took in huge amounts of it. Our oil took in massive amounts of it. And the thing is that in the 1980s onwards, we, the, the Thatcher government forward, we privatized all our utilities. British gas, yeah. we used to own it. British airways, we used to own it. Thames water, didn't we call, used to call Thames water because it, it was our water, yeah. right? All the things... If you've ever played Monopoly, anyone knows, you get the utilities quick, get them early because mm. they, they rack them up. We don't own any of it. In France, where they own a lot of EDF energy, which is often, I think where we now get something like, I think we literally get 60 or 70% of our actual energy from National Grid from EDF energy. Um, they they part nationalized, they, they're part, it's partly nationalized, but they've put a cap at 2% rises on their energy bills. Yeah. These, these sort of huge changes in the cost of living in such a short period of time are going to have a drastic effect on a lot of people whose wages have been suppressed for a huge amount of time. And while those wages have been suppressed, so for instance, right now there's a lot of talk about the rail workers, a lot of striking rail workers, mm. th their wages have been suppressed for over a decade. Meanwhile, shareholders and executives have taken out record profits. Yeah. And they have not reinvested in the service. Wow. So it's like, it's not is, like is this, it's gotten is it any better. It's just pure greed. It's, to, it's, it's totally, always greed, it's, though. It's always greed. It isn't really it? is greed. And I think it really goes down to a sort of motto in, during Reagan and Thatcher. And, and, and so the greed was good. It's good. Yeah, it's a it good born. thing. The, the thing is, the social contract, you know, between all of us is that we live in a country. I don't see myself as traditional, sort of right and left. Everyone seems to think I'm sort of some la radical left-winger, but all I really want is a healthcare system 
that is free from cradle to grave. I want a good, well-funded police force. I want a really well-funded fire service. Do you know how badly funded our fire service is? Mm. It's ridiculous. Like the amount of units that were taken out of action, when I say a unit, a, a, a fire truck, wages suppressed, huge amounts of cuts. We saw what it was like when it hit 40 degrees. I know, yeah. Scary stuff. There are a lot of reports saying that that day was the busiest day for the fire service since the Second World War. Fucking hell. What? So busy, so many things to deal with, mm. right? And I, and I want welfare. I want people to be, I actually believe in universal basic income. Like I think the government should be paying people a set rate to have a basic amount of money in their accounts. Because in the next 20 years, the world has become far more automated. Mm. That automation, whether it's taxi drivers, tube drivers, whatever, it means a lot of people, and we're talking yeah. hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people. What do you do with them? Yeah, I know. The, the, the scariest thing for me about the future is where human need is going to become irrelevant. Where you don't. I just hope we, we get there because we, we are really like. I, I, people need to kind of wake up to this. Mm. Like, we. It's also, it's, it's sort of in real, with reality TV as well. The British love, particularly our generation, distracting ourselves. Mm. A lot of people see like white privilege as the idea that you don't really need to be involved in social issues because they don't affect you, right? We all need to wake the fuck up to what's going on right now because unless we get involved, and a lot of the time that literally just means like, wait for the next election to come and actually vote. Yeah. Right, because so many people. What percentage of people vote in the country? I mean, there is a shocking, it's, it's our demographic and younger, the, the, the people who don't vote. The reason that, that the Tories even say this stuff they do is because the people, the most, most people that vote are plus 65. Wow. And there's more plus 65 year olds than there's ever been in the history of any the, time. Because everyone's staying alive. And, Asian and, they, and, and guess what? They've got very, very different ideas to people like us. And then you've got dickheads like Russell Brown who go along and say things like, oh, don't vote. What? What are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, he's gone off the absolute deep end now. <laughs> I mean, all for the likes and the views. It's, I'm 100% sure. No, I, I, dude, I, I think you speak a huge amount of sense. My, my thing- Sorry, is, that was a bit of a fucking no, monologue there, not. wasn't it? Jesus no, Christ. No, but it's good. It's so good and it's interesting. And it, it's well, my, I think a lot of the- I think a lot of people, maybe I'm in this bracket, I don't know. I hope I'm not. But I think a lot of people become selfish because if you delve into that sort of political regime at the moment and understand what's going on in the world, it can become quite depressing. And so what you want to do is almost distract yourself because but you're Jay, like- this is, I, I, this is get, the thing. Is, is I, of course it's depressing. Yeah. Do, you remember, do you remember Archie Manners? Yeah, you know, yeah, Josh yeah, Beats yeah, yeah, Archie. yeah. So we, had a, we did a show at Wilderness. I do this show every year there. And um, Archie was like, someone's talking about the empire. I went to an extremely, extremely posh public school. Uh, we've had lots of, um, lots of prime ministers. And I can tell you now that at no point in my entire education did anyone say, you know, that British Empire stuff, that was quite questionable, wasn't it? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> the reason my grandfather's grandfather's grandfather got that pad in the country was actually because uh, I was involved in a massacre or I was a great general or I help take all the sugar out of a country. Mm. Or I, you know, we are so unaware of our own um, past. What, what, yeah. what were the reason? And the reason now you've got these mad culture warrior daily mail crazies going, if you look at your own past empirically, and empirically just means the observable facts mm. rather than with an emotional agenda, things are clear. They're therefore, you hate this country or you're unpatriotic. What's a load of tired nonsense? Mm. You can love, I, the reason I'm interested in this stuff is because I love my country and I love the people in it and they need often help, you know? And I don't think, look, man, I know real activists, satire and comedy, it's not the same thing, but something that's been good about the, the, the podcast and, the, and, the, and doing, you know, the new conspiracies being that, you know, you get to talk about things. A lot of people, they feel scared to talk about it. They're yeah. like, oh, I don't know enough. No one knows enough. Mm. But you know, if you, you know, often, it's often it's the guy getting punched down to. I mean, like Jesus Christ, we're living in a time where we're literally being told by a woman who is herself, a, the daughter of a first generation immigrant, 
that we should put people who are the most vulnerable who've got over here on planes to Rwanda to deal with them mm. rather than just help integrate them. Because the narrative is, oh my God, it's not enough room over here when actually refugees take up less than 0.5% of the population are a net benefit to the economy. Steve Jobs was an immigrant mm. in America. Look what he did. Mm. But the narrative is, oh, we can't afford it because we've just been defunding our public services for so long. And then these offshore fucking magnates like Rodemir, who owns the Daily Mail. Hi. <laughs> Sidebar of shame. How's it going? I, it'd be good to see if this actually gets some, yeah. some radical write-up. You know, or, 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 you know, the Murdoch Empire. You know, they've got their own agenda. And they've been going literally. And there's this great meme. I'm not sure if you've seen it. Murdoch's looking across the table at this guy in a high-vis jacket. And there's an immigrant sitting in between them. And he goes, he was like, he's after your cookies, mate. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the narrative. Yeah. It's always fear-based policy making, isn't it? Like fear is the most powerful thing to get hold it's of. It's like we talk, whether we're talking about therapy or this, the people, clever people understand that, you know, as Freud said, man has very base subconscious drives. So if you point to someone, you go, it's their fault. A lot of people, they get down with that. Mm. As someone with a Jewish surname, that scares the absolute shit out of me. It really does. If you could compare our sort of climate at the moment to another time in history, where would you say we're at? If you I think to... a lot of people feel that it's un, um, inarguable in many ways that there are huge parallels to the 1930s that's happened now. In the 1930s, in Germany particularly, you had hyperinflation. But also what people don't really realise about someone like Hitler was Hitler was really the first person to go viral on radio. Wow. Like he got radio, right? Like he got how to put his speeches out there. Mm. In fact, like get people fumed, get people absolutely, you know, gassed up. Look at Trump. Trump is literally thinking about running yeah, again. He's going again, isn't right? he? Yeah. Yeah, of course he is. And he'll probably win. Yeah. You know, but look at even Farage. You know, these people over here, these winch bags, these guys who are prepared to get on dinghies, go out, I'm not trying to help people, but for content, pointing at them, going, mm. look, they're, they're coming in coming over here, they're going to, they're going to ruin the country. They're going to ruin you. You know, they, 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 they understand fear-based politics. Mm. It's people who go after trans people and go, your children are being degendered in primary school. Being, people who get upset about like drag queens reading people books. Like, I mean, these people know what they're doing. Mm. Like I, I believe anyway. That's no, I, I do. I think it's, and your podcast is where yeah. you have all of these discussions. Well, it's all, called, yeah. So let me, so it's called The New Conspiracist. Yeah. And because, you know, I'm a silly person as well, I decided, who, who can I do this with? Who's quite unimpeachable. <laughs> <laughs> so I got the global editor of the Bureau in, of Investigative Journalism, yeah. uh, a, a journalist called James Ball. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's my kind of sidekick geek co-host. Fucking knows a lot more shit than I do. Let's be honest. And, um, and we have, you know, we, we will deal with everything from uh, where well, the moon landing's faked to what? Um, why why do women's clothes not have pockets? Quick, quick, quick thing. Uh, quick thing. I want to hear moon landing fake or no? So I, I don't think moon landing is fake. We had Alex Gibney on. Do you know him? He's got this great Netflix documentary on yes, at the minute I, called How to Change Your Mind. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah course, absolute yeah. genius but documentary maker. He doesn't, but you'd be surprised how many of our guests. Do. Do. Mm. But we've just had, we had Marina Hyde on net just recently. Uh, Self-esteem. Um, Self-esteem's great. You I like Self-esteem. Self oh, I love her. Yeah, she's going to probably come on this podcast. She's, she's talking to the, the very interesting schism that we find ourselves in between. None, none of us have kids, right? No. Right. So we're living slightly outside that heteronormative reality of get to 30, yeah. mortgage, kids. Marriage. There isn't really a narrative around it. And I feel like she, she's sort of talking to that. She's creating the narrative. Always. She's, a, mm. I think she's. Yeah, she's incredible. wicked. I did a show with her the other day. I've done another show with her. She's just awesome. I love it the biz. Uh, where can we get the podcast as well? So, I mean, The New Conspiracist is, you know, out wherever it could, but you can also get, if you go to newconspiracist.com, yeah. you can sign up and we do sort of an extra episode every week where we respond to kind of the mailbag. Uh, and we also talk to, you know, we talk about slightly different stuff. Get that subscription one. That's a good one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But it's, it's also, one. it's also, I think what I felt like, like, have you ever seen the conspiracy chart? You ever seen this? Oh yeah. It's yeah, so yeah, yeah. good. It's like a triangle. This girl on TikTok made it. And it's like, because basically I think we can all agree that 
conspiracy theories are at their zenith now, right? I mean, they're everywhere. Mm. And what and part of the reason is because people like Donald Trump say things like fake news. And Boris Johnson even really recently, a couple of weeks ago, in a tweet said like deep state. Fucking deep state from Boris Johnson. A man who quite literally skipped his own fucking minders, <laughs> went off with the son of a KGB operative to, as foreign secretary to a villa where he was seen coming back on like a fucking easy jet flight. This guy, <laughs> Boris de Feffel fucking shitface. <laughs> the cheek of the man is genuinely quite extraordinary. <laughs> what a fuckhead. <laughs> Just don't get it. Just don't get it. What a fuckhead. He is a supreme bellend. I've got, to, and I mean, I honestly think it, as our national symbol of bellendness, it, he, he has summed up exactly where we are in the minds of everyone else. Dude, um, I, um, I, the, the passion that you have is, is, is pretty insanely, it's, it's just, it's, it's, um, it's pretty good. Do you know what it is, dude? I had a really good history teacher. Yeah. And he brought me to, when I was very, very young, I remember seeing like Caroline Lucas and, you know, some of these people on stage talking about empathy. So Tony Benn as well, amazing orator. And it made me realize that the, the, main, the, the, the biggest gift you can give, I think, is attention, um, especially when you're in a position of privilege, to use your platform to, 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 to just harness further empathy. And the other thing is that, just like with Sato, the new conspiracy was set up because, you know, things like QAnon, the, the conspiracies around like, the, the anti-vaxxers. Mm. This was serious stuff. This was literally killing people. Yeah. And so for me, it was like, if we can equip people through the podcast to go down and feel a bit braver to take on that mate in the pub yeah, and sort of go like, I think you're kind of chatting shit, mate, and this is why, then, then great. Then you've done it. Then do you know what I mean? I love Good it. Good stuff. I love it. Dude, listen, um, whenever we see each other, we um, have oh, a great time. Yeah, there's a lot of love, man. And I love that. It really is. There's a lot of love. I think I, it's great. Dude, I think the thing is that you, I think you're in a, reaching an interesting stage yourself, Jay, and you're doing it, you know, you're talking about your relationship more, but I think there's a huge opportunity now because do you know what, what genuinely does scare me a bit is if we don't as like a collective and not left and right, just people of Britain, mm. Dis, start disowning some of these absolute hyper super bellends who have been like the Frogers, the Johnsons, you know, and just kind of go, guys, we really got to do this very differently now. Got to kind of look after each other because we are independent Britain now. Mm. This is who we are. Like I find it, I find it kind of amazing. And I think it is sort of time that we all collectively were like, we really need to, it sounds, I mean, I'm going to get, I reckon I'll get smashed for this, but just look after each other a bit better. Yeah. yeah. I think mate, I think it's a great you know? message. I think it's a great message. Have empathy and look out for each other. Mm. Look out for your neighbor, right? I totally agree with you. Dude, I really appreciate you coming on. Oh, I, mate, I, I'm going to go, I, I, and I say this sometimes to people who come like, yeah, I'm going to listen to your podcast. I'm 100% going to listen oh, to your podcast. It's I, great. Yeah, I can't wait. Oh, mate, you should listen to, I mean, David Badil talking about the Jews. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Because what we found in it is scary. It's 95% of the conspiracy theories always come back to the Jews did it. <laughs> really? The Jews, it's always either the Jews or the Muslims. Sometimes the gays, sometimes the gays do it. But what we find is that most conspiracy theories come back to, you know, blood libel or some fucking weird mad, you know, cause we've been, we've been looking at everything from like the Illuminati to, so you know, but it is but also genuinely stuff like why do women's clothes not have pockets? Why does it? Well, because you go back to it. Have you, you must have heard this before about the Coca-Cola bottle, right? Marilyn yeah. Monroe. Exactly. So the shape oh, of the Coca-Cola okay. bottle yeah. is sort of... The women's sort of fear, Marilyn Monroe. Proportionate to Marilyn Monroe. whatever the current image of beauty mm. is yeah. for women's body. And it, you know, it was the same with, with pockets. What? It was about women just having the right cut of clothes rather than... Why would a woman need a pocket? Mm. There was like, it's really interesting. We, we looked what? at subversive literature around the time of the French Revolution that was literally saying, beware of women with pockets. 
because <laughs> that is, you don't know what they might be up to. That is nuts. It's amazing. But also this is what I mean is sometimes it's the sublime, sometimes it's the ridiculous. It's not all, you know, we started with an episode with Josh and Archie, which was like, was Avril Lavigne killed and replaced by a body double? Yeah, I heard this one. Yeah, Do you yeah, know yeah, what yeah, I mean? yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Everyone thinks Avril Lavigne died. Yeah, she died and then she's replaced. But by people someone. are like really into it. I love that shit. And, it, and it's so cool because in a way, the story of that sums it up, which was it started on Brazilian Twitter. And the guy he posted the first week literally says in the first week, look, this is a joke, but mm. does and then it, it doesn't this it. woman look like she's been replaced Avril Lavigne? And then it became an actual thing. I so love good. that. Dude, I'm going to listen to that. We also follow you on your Instagram. We can see your shows. Yeah, all this, Jolly and, uh, this is how dyslexic I am. I thought my Instagram was Jolly and Rubes. I was like, cool. Surname's Rubenstein. It's actually Jolly and Rubs. Yeah, 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 yeah. J O L Y O N R U B S. And then my mate was like, oh, that's clever because you, you're trying to rub people up the wrong way. I was like, yep. No, that's. <laughs> Yes, yeah, yeah, no, that's, take it. Of course, that's what I meant. Do you go check it out? All the stuff that you do is amazing, and um, oh, and there's so many other things sweet. we haven't spoken about today, which you do in terms of shows and all these other stuff that no one really. No, I'd love you to check out. There's a new show coming out, ITV2, award-winning. Don't hate the players. Returns for yeah. its for its. This fourth, is your show. Series, show I came up with. Yeah, it's great. Like, people just little don't white know Jewish guy he loves hip hop. <laughs> <laughs> you know, no, but listen, hip hop karaoke is the greatest thing in the world, and. You know, why not turn into a show? I freaking love that. People have done so well with it. London Hughes, yeah. off in Hollywood. It's amazing. Leisha, Maya, Jordan. But yeah, so that and the scripted stuff, that's coming later. We'll have a bit more of an announcement later in the year about a number of shows, hopefully. But yeah, don't hate the players. But the New Conspiracist, yeah, check it out. Newconspiracist.com or wherever you get We're going to leave the link below in the description. So go and check that out there. Great. Dude, I thank you so much for coming oh, on the podcast. We really appreciate it. Um, hey, everybody, we're going to see you next week for another episode. Until then, goodbye. Bye-bye.